that. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. It's uh, a pleasure to be here and uh, pleasure to see so many happy, smiling faces. I'm not sure if you've come for the food or but, uh, that, that's okay. I completely understand as a as an undergrad and, and as a as a postgrad too. So. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about some of the research we're doing, and, and I really felt uh, impressed to talk about uh, one of the research projects that we're doing. And we actually involved a number of uh, medical graduates in in the research, and so I'm really presenting on behalf of them and, and, and myself. We work together to, to achieve this outcome, and, and and part of the discussion, I really want to um, I really wanted to involve you. Um, in 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 the presentation and, and part of the discussion, there's still some questions from the research we did, and, and I thought maybe uh, you, as a, a group of students and, and, and academic faculty, may have some insights that, that, that we, as as a research team, did weren't quite um, some insights that, that we, as the research team, may have not uh, considered. So this is uh, this is usually me. Uh, this is usually how I plan my presentation, and then this is usually how it goes. So <laughs> just ro roll with the punches. So uh, so a little bit of what, today we'll talk a little bit about me and my motivation, and then we'll actually get into the study and the rationale. We'll talk a little bit about the methods. We probably won't discuss too much, and then we'll go into the research findings and we'll have some discussion. And then where to next? Now the learning outcomes for today, I, I really thought about, well, what is it that I want you to get from this? What is it that you could get from this? I want you to really want to get a critical insight that underpins public health and health research. I want you as, as students to critically appraise the research findings. And we'll do that through some discussion. And also apply the principles and knowledge of public health to recommend solutions. And also critically reflect, critique and judge how the research may be applied in a wider healthcare environment. So for those of you who to get some, uh, some free lunch and uh, you, you, you might get uncomfortable here again because if you ask another question, getting you to think and talk. So. Okay, so a little bit about me. And I thought, well, I could, I could spend a whole lecture talking about me. I know that's pretty, pretty expert in the knowledge of me, but I thought I'd just share a few things. Um, for those who... who may know, I, I, I actually served a mission in South Africa, and while I was there, um, I just wanted to, uh, we, we had Nelson Mandela, who was still the president at the time, and, and what really, I guess, what I came away from, not only teaching the gospel, was, was I came away thinking, okay, I've taught the gospel to these wonderful people, what have I, what have I gained from them, and how can that impact my life? And so I came away thinking, I really loved doing the service projects that we did. We worked in a lot of hospitals, we did a lot of public health things. Um, I think the grossest thing we ever did was um, we had a pets day where all the people from the townships came out and brought their pets and we vaccinated them and picked ticks off and all sorts of wonderful things. So that was a bit disgusting but it was memorable but that we were actually making a difference in the community. And so it was Mandela that, uh, <clears throat> Mandela that motivated me in, in trying to improve the, the, the communities that, that he um, was trying to make a change and a difference in. Now, does anybody know who the next person is? Or anybody else? No? Okay. So we have, oh, we'll go back. Now yeah, I've given it all away. So we have Mandela. We also have Mary Sarah Cole. And for those who don't know Mary Sarah Cole, she was, she was at the time of um, Nightingale. Does anybody know Nightingale? Yeah. Okay, Mary Sarah Cole is around the era of Nightingale. She actually met Nightingale. Mary Sarah Cole was from Jamaica. And at the time, there was the, uh, the Crimean War. And Nightingale was asked to go to the Crimean War and, and help the, the people at the front. And Mary Sarah Cole from Jamaica wrote to the British government and said, I'd like to provide my services and they denied her and so she, instead of saying well I tried she said I'll, 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 I'll raise my own money and go over and she went over and, and, and helped the, the Crimean War 
efforts and, and help to nurse a lot of um, of the injured and sick. And we don't often hear about Mary Sarah Cole, but I, and I, I really appreciate her dedication and service to, to the men and women that fought that war. And she is a, she's a hero to me. We also have Amim Cesar, and he, he's a, a, a francophone poet. He, writes, he wrote a lot of French poetry. And uh, as a boy, I read some of his poetry that really moved me around social justice for all, and particularly those who were in the, col the French colonies. And uh, he became quite a, quite a um, good politician and, and uh, really inspired me. The other is Catherine Hamlin, and she's a, an Australian gynecologist who answered an ad in The Lancet to go out to Ethiopia and to uh, assist the people there for a, a couple of years. She's still there today. She'd never left. And she built a hospital and, and helped women who had uh, uh, a number of birth complications leading to fistula. Um, and built a, built a fistula hospital and done great service to more than 50,000 women. And so she is a hero to me. And inspire, continues to inspire me. Also, we, we also have Helen Keller. I have a special... Um, special thing for Helen Keller. My, my father is actually deaf, and so Helen Keller really continues to inspire me each day. That despite her, her difficulties in being blind and deaf, that she was able to do a, go on and do great things. So when I'm having a down moment, I just think of Helen Keller. Does everybody know the story of Helen Keller? Mm -hmm. Would anybody like to tell us? Um, when she was young, she contracted scarlet fever. And um, she was like two, so she still ha she had developed speech patterns, which is why she was able to speak later on in life. But um, she was like a wild child. Her family had no idea what to do with her, and they brought in a teacher for her. And she wasn't making any progress. And um, finally, she took her out, and they had like a shed behind the house, and she lived there with Helen to separate her from her family. Yep. And um, you have a picture of the water pump, which is why, because that's the first word that Helen recognized. She would sign the letters into her hand. She'd write them on. Yep. And she felt the pump of water. This is water. Yep. Yep. So. And, and I guess that's that's the. And that's right, and, and I really love the, the story that, that the water pump, that water really changed her life, and, the, and it was that flood of information and knowledge that she gained from, from that experience. Okay, so what does a canary have to do with a coal mine? Does anybody know? Yeah? They, the miners back in the day used to keep the canaries down there, so if there was, was a carbon monoxide, uh, they, the canary would die first. Like when it stopped, like tweeting, they knew it was time to get out of there. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. So all the noxious gases and different bits and pieces. It, it was. It's a sentient, sent, sentient being, which means that that uh, very sensitive to think changes in the in the environment and uh, can impact it. And they knew it was time to get out. And to us, the the metaphor is an advance warning of some danger. So I want you to just think about that as we talk talk about our discussion today. Okay, so why am I using the metaphor? Why use that metaphor here? What does that have to do with asthma, hospitalizations, and family medicine? There's a spectrum of asthma severity, and those, especially children and elderly and people with severe cases, are on one side of the spectrum. They're the first, they're the canary. And they notice the pollution, they notice those environmental effects that are going to become exacerbated. Okay. Yeah. Sounds great. That's right. Anybody else? We're all happy with that answer. Well, I was just gonna say, like, public health is all about prevention, and so that's kind of along with that. Like, the canaries there should prevent others from being harmed. <coughs> okay. Just think about. Just think about that. It, it's great that, that that answer that you gave, but yeah, certainly think about the things that we'll talk about today and what, why we're using that metaphor. <coughs> the other thing, the other challenge that they used to have in the mine is, is uh, they forget to watch the canary. So the canary would sometimes die, and they didn't realize that it had died, so that sometimes it was too late. So the, my question is, who is watching the canary? Metaphorically, who's watching the canary? And again, think about that as we go through today. Does anybody know who this gentleman is? And again, there's another water pump involved. 
Sorry? John Snow. John Snow? John Snow? Uh, yeah. Who's John Snow? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anybody know who okay. So he was the one who discovered, well, there's a bunch of cholera kind of breaking out in, <laughs> in London, and he <laughs> was able to track it down, like, see the area, and he was able to trade it to this water pump. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, yeah, certainly. So John, John Snow, uh, not only, uh, and we'll learn a little bit about John Snow in a few minutes, but he not only found out about cholera and where it was coming from, but he also inspired me to go into research. And so I see him as an inspiration, and, that, and that's really where we're at today. This is why I'm up here gabbling on and you're waiting for your lunch. <laughs> but uh, we thanks to John Snow. So let, let's learn a little bit about John Snow. London, England. In 1854, the largest city in the industrial world, with a population of two and a half million. And the smelliest one. Raw sewage is dumped straight into the streets and river. Underground streams and wells are polluted by leaking cesspools and sewers. London stinks, and death takes its toll. In the summer of 1854, another devastating cholera epidemic breaks out. It strikes the Soho neighborhood of London. In a single night, 200 people show signs of the deadly disease. Within hours, they die of dehydration. Ten days later, over 600 people are dead. Most people believe the disease is spread by foul-smelling air. But a young doctor has another theory. John Snow suspects cholera is spread by contaminated water. The doctor starts investigating. Going door to door, he keeps track of all cholera cases in Soho. Drawing a dot for each case on a map, a pattern emerges. The cases concentrate in a small area around Broad Street. What's the link between these people? They all take their drinking water from the water pump in Broad Street. John Snow is sure the Broad Street pump is the killer. The doctor persuades local authorities to remove the pump handle. No handle, no water, no more cases of cholera. The outbreak stops. <laughs> John Snow simply gathered and plotted data points. Then he turned this data into actionable insight. People like John Snow started a revolution in healthcare. The okay, we must have been there just for time, but... So what John Snow did, and, and what they don't mention is, John actually, John actually got the local minister to go and knock on that door. He, the minister was able to open doors that John Snow could not do, which gives us insight into in what, re, how we need to conduct research. We need to involve local people. And actually, when they did the study, when, when he mapped it out and went to the local authorities, they didn't quite believe him. Um, and so we, he really had to work with them, and, and there was a couple of other people involved in that process as well. And, and within four years, because of this and a number of other cholera outbreaks, the public sewer system was developed in London, one of the major public works, public health works happening in London at the time. And funnily enough, the, that, that system is only just starting to reach its peak and they're starting to rebuild the, the sewer system in London at this time. So it's lasted quite a while. What a great uh, impact that has had. So John Snow, he was an observant man. He looked at the evidence and then went, went and made some conclusions. So I wanted to, you, as, as, a, as a group of students, I want you to think about how observant are you? And and also, it's about it's easy to miss something. Sometimes, sometimes you're not looking for. Them. And so, I thought what we do is just do a quick exercise and see how observant you are. I'm going to share you, share with you a public health message from the UK, and uh, it, it's, it'll be self-explanatory. But I just want you to think about what what's happening here and, and how observant are you as students. Clearly. 
Finally, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, son. But I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. But, but, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? So did anybody notice the 21 changes from that scene? Yeah. <laughs> anybody? Oh, I did. <laughs> All right, let, let's continue. And I want you to just think about what this message is telling us, this public health message. Uh, clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who at precisely 3.30 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. But I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest. Lady Smythe! <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's incredible, isn't it? Often we don't see things. Okay, so that was an advert in, in the UK for cyclists, because they were having a lot of accidents. But really, the exercise is around observation. How observant are we? And, that, and, that how, and that's how we move into our our, our topic that we're talking about today. So asthma, it's an inflammatory disease of the airways, it causes shortness of breath and wheezing, coughing and even death, it's in, and it's in response to triggers. Symptoms are usually reversible, either spontaneously or with treatment. There's a greater explanation, but just for this exercise, I want you to be aware of that. Okay, so we're, we're just talking about the prevalence in Australia. We're just talking about Australia, we're talking about what we know and what the study that we conducted has the highest prevalence of asthma across the globe. 10% of the population have been diagnosed, were diagnosed in 2011-2012, leading to 36,000 hospitalizations. Well, 36,000 36, in, in 2008. And our indigenous population are twice as likely to have asthma than anyone else. The prevalence is impacted by physical, social, and environmental factors. And there's some theories around why it's so prevalent in, in Australia and I'm happy to answer those questions later. Okay, so management, management of asthma. It's controlled with good management and under the guidance of family physicians, and that's how it's managed in Australia. And out of every, uh, out of every, uh, it should say a thousand population, so 16 asthma visits per thousand population, which accounts for 3% of all primary care consultations. And at those primary, so primary care consultations, that they, it's around self-management training, regular medical reviews, and improved health. And <coughs> the aim is improved health outcomes. They often use an, use an asthma action plan, and this is one example here of what it looks like. And it's part of the national guidelines for asthma management. So it's around educating individuals with asthma: what do they need to do when they're well, when they're not well, and if symptoms persist, persist, symptoms persist. The challenge is that only 20% of asthma action plans and 40% of children have asthma action plans. The challenges, challenges are that it's a hospital avoidable condition and many, many continue to seek, seek care at the hospital setting, either because of limited primary care health access, the cost, they might just avoid it, or they're um, a dislike or or there's poor compliance or improper use of asthma medications. And often it's not, it's not the medication, but it's how it's administered, which is a big challenge. They may not um, have an asthma action plan, or there might be poor attitudes to self-management. And the literature says that asthma hospitalizations are a key indicator of primary health care quality. 
So the study motivation, why, why we did the study. Um, I talked a little bit about um, with my colleagues this morning that I, I come from an area that's high agriculture. So we produce 95% of the, the country's pears in a small geographical <coughs> area. We do a lot of broad acre cropping, things like wheat, canola, um, and also apples and, and stone fruit as well. So there's a lot of agricultural spray happening. And the word of mouth and the things in the local newspaper were really focused around um, there's agricultural, agricultural sprays causing asthma. And so I started the question, well, if that's the case, then we, why, why aren't we doing more about it? Let's, and we wanted to find out. We wanted to be observant to what was actually happening. We wanted to look at what was actually really the cause of asthma. Was it really ag agricultural sprays? And if you know, I've just got that lovely picture of the horse. Uh, it's a, it, they are spraying, but I, I, I wrote more put it there for the horse than the... <laughs> <laughs> so the aims of our research, we wanted to examine the changes in asthma hospitalizations over time. We wanted to determine the key factors that remain and continue to impact these hospitalizations. We also wanted to verify if rural and urban asthma hospitalizations, I've got the Australian spelling there, remain desperate and ascertain if there was an agricultural impact. Our methods we use, our primary data source was hospital data. Um, we were able to glean or were able to collect all hospital admi uh, admissions data um, for all the chronic diseases across the state of Victoria. Um, so it came out to be about 1.5 million hospitalizations just for chronic disease alone. Um, and it's called the Victorian Admit Episodes of Data. Uh, episodes data set. And it included across the state there were 97, uh, 79 counties and 111 <coughs> hospitals, either public or private. Secondary data or other additional data sources included the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the Department of Health and Planning, and the Department of Community Development, Vic Health, and also Medical Director of Australia. So we used other sources of data to try and answer our questions. The data included sex, age, Indigenous status, we looked at the percentage of smokers per county and the residents of the, and the, the county of residence. We wanted to see if the public or private patient, the length of stay in the hospital, and, and how they were discharged into the community. We also used the ICD-10 to determine who, who was being admitted for asthma. And there are other, a number of other socioeconomic factors that we looked at as well, and that's what those are there. I'm happy to talk about those further. And we also looked at the number of family phys physicians in the county per thousand population. And we used hierarchical and multivariate um, weight list scores and regression. And we adjusted for smoke, smoking and sex. And we used, uh, significant was, significance was determined at 0 .5, 0 0.05. So the results, um, across, over the five year period, there were 50,000 asthma hospitalizations in Victoria. Over half of those were for children zero to nine years old, and just under half were female. And we noted that uh, uh, just under one fifth were privately funded patients. So there was a high public public use. And if you notice in the in the um, in the chart that uh, you can see, looking at the incidence per thousand population, the incidence rate is quite high for those that are zero to ten years old. And we notice there's a there's a, a slight increase in the elderly as well. Okay. So we wanted to just look at the years, what was happening each year, and the rate of the incidence of, of hospitalizations. And we noticed that there was a, it, it was reasonably steady. There was some decline here, and we'll go into that further. So that was just our, that was our preliminary data. Then we wanted to look at the metro versus the rural populations. Was, was rural really the issue? And we noted that 77% uh, of those hospitalizations from, from metro areas, the length of stay was significantly higher in rural populations, but the average, average rate, the average incidence rate of, of being, of attending a hospital, or being hospitalized was much lower in rural areas. So we, we, we noted that, that uh, in, in rural areas, you, you, that people tended to stay longer but there was less of them being admitted. And also we looked at uh, how they performed over time as well. And graphically, it looks something like this. 
Now the green line is our, our metro and the blue line is our standard from the, the original slide. And also uh, the red, you're looking at rural. So there's obviously something happening here, but we'll get into that. We actually went back because we, we thought we'd done the calculations wrong and we recalculated four different times because we noted that the difference had changed since the last a similar study was conducted um, in the early 2000s. In the early 2000s, we noted, noted that the rural incidence rate was much higher than metro. That's why we went back and we re-checked our, checked our numbers. We wanted to find out, did we make a mistake somewhere? But no, it, it was correct. So between, between this time and, and our current time, there'd been a reversal in the rural areas and we wanted to find out why. We also wanted to find out what this blip was here. Why is there sudden, this, this sudden decrease and then we wanted to find out, okay, well, if there's, why hasn't it followed that same pattern here? What's, there's something obviously happening here in rural areas. The rates of hospital admission, admissions have lowered significantly. Okay, so we went on and did, did the analysis. The predictors of hospitalisation. So if we, when we looked at the whole data, the things that came out were the percentage of smokers per county. Those that smoked, uh, well, there was a greater, the greater the percentage of smokers in the county, the higher the hospitalisation rate. Um, those that smoked in metro were 18.8% and rural was 20%. So there's high smokers in rural areas. And also we looked at uh, accessibility and remoteness, which was around how accessible is the hospital to each individual in a county. And we noted that the more remote you were, the lower rate of asthma hospitalisation. That was something that was interesting. We wanted to investigate further. Then we just looked at the metropolitan data. We found that those who lived in metropolitan areas, if it was around the percentage, again, percentage of smokers in a county that, that impacted hospitalizations. And also, being male, there was an increase in hospitalizations as well. And after we adjusted for, for sex and smoking in our calculations, we found that it was the family physician ratio in the county so as the number of family physicians increased per 1,000 population, the hospitalizations decreased. So there was something happening there as well. And when we looked at the rural data, there was no predictors identified. And we were really, we were really scratching our heads, the, the medical students and I, how, we, how this could be. And then we went back and we, we gathered some more secondary data and we looked at the percentage of land use. You know, if, if it really was agricultural, an agricultural issue, then maybe that, that's what was missing. But still, there was no predictors. There was a high level of variability and randomness among the predictors. There was no particular reason why people were being hospitalised. Our other findings, we noted that uh, hospital length decreased by 33%. So if someone was admitted 15 years ago, their length of stay was fifth, uh, a third longer than it was in 2014, 2015. Statewide, there was a 10% decrease <coughs> in hospitalizations. Rural, significantly decreased by 40%, and metro areas actually increased. Okay, so we wanted to find out why, and I, I wanna ask you why. Not only about the decreases and increases, but I want you, uh, either in pairs or in threes, just to discuss why, why particularly there was this blip, and why there was this, this change in rural areas. So I'll just give you half a minute, a minute, to discuss between yourselves and if we can come up with some sort of <coughs> reason why that, that was happening. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> Okay. 
What we might do now is actually uh, in your groups or pairs. Do we have any solutions to why this was happening? Any possible hypothesis? Why was this happening? Why do we think this was happening? Yeah. Um, well, I'm not very familiar <coughs> with Australia or really what you guys do for public health initiatives, but <laughs> it could be something like that year they passed legislation that cut down on car traffic, and so that lowered the pollutants in the air, and so everyone was affected by less pollutants, which caused less hospitalization because of asthma. Okay. Yeah. One hypothesis. That's great. That's great. Anyone else? Yeah. To me, the data seem to show that it's the accessibility of healthcare as far as, not the blip, but the other aspects of it, that um, a, a rural family just is, not, doesn't have the accessibility, because especially it correlates with that finding about the, if they had more access to a physician, the hospitalizations went down because there was more preventative care, I would suppose, okay. um, controllers and yep. preventative inhalers. Yep. And maybe, I, was there a, some sort of a, Accessibility policy change that happened in like the year 2010 oh, right? and that. access and <laughs> care that happened within the uh, uh -huh. Sounds good. Any other hypothesis? There's no wrong answer. One more? Okay. Uh, we were thinking perhaps. Um, that the primary care physicians in uh, the metro area were maybe just more oversaturated with patients, so they weren't able to be as thorough in their care uh, and, and doing a better job at, at prevention so okay. that they would end up going, uh, having to go to, to hospital. Okay. Yeah. No, it sounds great. That's, and, and, this is, and this is how we sort of started to think about the data. We were looking at the data, we were observing the data, and, and trying to look at things that we weren't, weren't really aware of. Like the, like the who done it. We really wanted to look at that. Yeah. I just wanted to know, it would probably be important to look at migration patterns to see if the increase in asthma in metro areas might be a result of urbanization and people just leaving those rural areas to go to more urban yeah. areas to create more yeah, yeah. Yeah. And on the flip side, people might have seen more opportunity in rural areas to farm and okay. move to these areas. Yeah, yeah. One more, last one. Did you gather any data on like corticoid prescription rates, like preventative medicines? No, that's how that's that's how next step. So you, you're beating me to the punch, <laughs> but that that's great. That's great. That's things that we're thinking about. Okay. So what we went we went and had a look. We went to have a look and try and make make sense of the data. So in 2008, 2009, there was a new four-year federal asthma program announced. So it was announced in 2008, but it actually didn't start until 2010. Um, which was just about here, so it was announced. And there was around greater proactive management, having better best practice management treatments, and also developing primary healthcare workforce respiratory skills. So actually upskilling the Jeep, upskilling the family physicians and the, and the care nurses and so forth. Something else that happened in, in July of 2011, which was just about here, was the announcement there were new therapies listed on a subsidised pharmaceutical benefit scheme, which meant that some asthma medications that patients had to pay out pay eight hundred and twenty dollars for was now reduced to between four dollars eighty two and twenty nine dollars. So it made that, that medication more accessible to some patients. And also in two thousand twelve and two thousand thirteen, there was some sort of me me um, meteorological phenomenon happening. Something in the spring, the springtime, something happened. It was a stream weather event. The lows were 73.5 and the highs were 114.4, which is, which that's, <coughs> that's summer weather. That's that's the weather in summer rather than the, in the springtime. So we sort of hypothesised that there was something that, that happened in that, that heat that uh, lowered that rate. So that, that's what we hypothesised, some sort of extreme weather event and there was some <coughs> policy or legislation, we weren't quite sure. We needed to go and observe and dig more into what else was happening. So the other contributing factors, 2010, the legis there was legislation on smoking in cars with children. It was now outlawed to smoke in a car while driving um, with children in the car. There was also restricted internet tobacco advertising and an increase in tobacco excise. 
So it meant um, in, 2000, in 1998, there was 20, 20 cents per cigarette tax on, 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 on tobacco. And that led, and in 2016, it went up to 40, 40 cents per cigarette. So quite a high cost to try and reduce that. And there were reduced numbers in tobacco smoking as well. And um, a, a greater number of children being, a, a greater reduction in children being exposed to indoor tobacco smoke as well. I just wanted to think, and we, we, we tried to think, did we miss something? So this is, this is, our, this is our graph again. Policy legislation, screen, extreme weather event, subsidised pharmaceuticals, internet tobacco, plain packaging, smoking in cars, asthma, the asthma redesign, there was uh, the tax on tobacco. So there were all these other things happening at the time that may have caused, may have caused these things. But we still thought, is there something else that we've missed? And we'll get to that in a few minutes. So the, our study conclusions were that socioeconomic status, level of education, and occupation were not always predictive of asthma hospitalisation. Being male, smoking, and having fewer GPs per, per population in the county were significant predictors of hospital admissions among metro residents. In rural, there may be other high level there, that we thought we surmised that there was some high level of heterogeneity, which is a lot of difference, a lot of difference happening between rural counties that may contribute to the di diversity of protected, protective effects or asthma triggers that lead to hospitalizations. For us, the common thing was, oh, there's just too much white noise. We can't sort of see through the forest what's happening. And we thought we might have missed something. Okay, so I want to pose the question to do to you. What do you think that we might have missed? What, what's the rural explanation? of that, not, not that, that past that blip, that decrease in that rural, that rural um, hospitalizations. I think you talked a little bit about um, that accessibility. Okay, I'll give you another half minute to discuss with each other and come up again with a couple of other hypotheses about that, the rural and what was happening in rural areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's a little bit more than a little bit of 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 a Maybe <laughs> there wasn't even a hospital to go to in the rural area. Actually, maybe they didn't have to drive. <laughs> <laughs> in the area. I'm sure they like, yeah. like, 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 Okay. So, any any, uh, any any rural any explanation for the rural phenomena? Any explanation? Yeah. Question: Are are the hospital are there as many hospitals available during the available time that where there's a dip? Uh, no, 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 no change, no change, no. Or very no, there wouldn't have been any change at all. Yep. But there are less hospitals in rural areas than in metro areas? Uh, yes. Yes? Yeah. So it might have something to do with that. Maybe? Maybe? Yes? Uh, during that increase in the rural areas, uh, there could have been an environmental event. There could be a period of extreme drought, lots of airborne dust, uh -huh. more triggers. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. We did think that. But no, there was, there, was a, there was a drought in the early 90s that went through into the early 2000s, but after that, it rained again. <laughs> it was too much rain. Uh, perhaps uh, like a legislation um, banning certain pesticide use or putting in place uh, pesticide use restrictions or something like that? Yeah. yeah. It's a great idea, and we did look into that, but there was no, no change. So it really was really something that, that really baffled us. <coughs> this is great. These are great ideas, and these are the things that, that myself and the other medical students sat down and talked about. Well, what is really happening here? And so we, we came to some other conclusions. 
Okay, we, we realized that the poor health access had some sort of an impact on self-efficacy of asthma management. In the rural communities, the residents, that, that were they just not seeking care at the hospital level? Were they using primary health care more than, uh, than the metro areas? Well, they're more likely to undertake pre preventative measures. Well, they're using other coping strategies. Or do they have greater self-efficacy than their urban counterparts? We, these are some of the things that we come up with. These are questions that we came up with. Is it that, that the hospital's 30, 35 minutes or 45 minutes or an hour away, well, I better have an action plan, an asthma action plan, or I better self-manage better self -manage with my primary care physician than the hospital being five minutes away. We even thought it had something to do with the, um, whether you're a private or public patient, but there was no, there was no difference. Okay, so this, the question that we come up with, or hypothesis, is does poor perceived healthcare access lead to greater self-efficacy in reduced, and reduced asthma hospitalization? So this, the, our initial study ask more questions. And so this is the next step of our study. We need to, we're going in to look at um, whether, and actually talking with, with asthma patients, and looking at what does hospitalization, oh, sorry, does having poor access make them or encourage them to have better management strategies? And, and o often with research, we, we, we dig a hole to find some gold, but we end up digging a greater big a, a bigger hole to find more. We end up with more questions than we have answers. Okay, so now I want you to discuss, using the evidence that we've given you, what other public health programs could be put in place specifically for rural or metropolitan areas? I'll give you another half minute. Come up with some solutions. We know that there was a great divide between rural and metro. What are some programs we could specifically put in place? We've heard a little bit about that today. Um, I wonder if they cost effect. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you get like, it's so effective. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Y
to you don't miss the obvious but keep looking keep digging and and with that I'd like to say thanks and thanks for having me folks if you have a we have a couple minutes for questions uh, in the meantime if you could fill out uh, the sheet we've given you and turn that in as you exit out here for your sandwich